All right. Hello. Welcome back for another podcast. This is Alan Shipnuck, and this one's going to be a little different. It's a little more intimate. Just one guest today. It's my great friend, Jack Grancolas. Uh, we met through golf. Jack is a, a very spirited playing partner and a very good stick. And uh, as we became friends, I, I came to know his his story um, that his, his pregnant college sweetheart, Lauren, uh, died aboard United 93. And as Jack told me more, and I learned more about this journey that he's been on ever ever since 9-11, I, you know, I said to him at some point, this would make an incredible book, Jack, if you were ever so inclined. And uh, his response was that, you know, his PTSI therapist had, had recommended he write this all down and that not only would it be cathartic for him, but it might help other people who've gone through their own their own challenges and hardships. And um, well, we, we sat together for the first time really in the spring of 2016. Jack talked and I just recorded it and took notes. And it's been quite a journey, but six and a half years later, the book is finally here. It's called Like a River to the Sea heartbreak and hope in the wake of united 93 um, it's uh, as of september 6th it's been published by uh, rare bird books a great little indie out of los angeles so jack we did it <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you are a very patient man alan <laughs> well uh you know it was it was a complicated uh process and so i thought in this conversation we'd talk a little bit about uh about your life you uh, the, this this path you've been on but um uh and of course the book itself but it's, it seems like we should start with golf this is kind of a, a golfy audience and it's really an important part of the story because not to jump ahead but you met lauren at the university of texas you were there to play golf and um, so it's really fundamental but let, let's back up a little further growing up in indiana what did golf mean to you and, and especially how important was it your with your relationship with your father yeah, golf was, uh, you know, a big part of my life since about seven, eight years old when I first started watching it on TV and knowing that every Sunday, Saturday and Sunday, that's where my dad was headed. And um, yeah, I was the youngest of six kids and there was a six year difference between the nearest sibling. So I kind of grew up in a big family for a while. And then when I became 12, it was like I was an only child because uh, they had all gone off. But I, I remember when I was seven, eight years old, hitting golf balls around the backyard. Trees were the target, hitting wiffle balls, mostly wiffle balls because the hard ones broke the window. And um, But, you know, the great thing for any kid out there is to learn by hitting wiffle balls because you can't overswing. You can't under, you know, you got to hit this. You got to hit them square to hit them good. So I learned how to shape shots by doing that. And became a very good little junior golfer uh, because I loved it. I uh, was a, a good putter at the time. And so I uh, started winning tournaments when I was nine and, uh, and uh, you know, kind of shocking some of the older guys. And I thought, hey, you know, this is this is fun, you know, and, uh, you know, making believers out of disbelievers. And as I went through, you know, the the junior golf circuit, I, you know, won a lot of tournaments and 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 was chosen to the tri-state team in Indiana and was, you know, really lucky to represent um, and uh, made it to the U.S. A junior amateur. And that's when I played against a pretty heady field, you know, and Nathaniel Crosby, Rick Furr, those were some of the big names in the junior circuit at the time. And so I thought, well, maybe if I could parlay this into a college uh, opportunity, I could go south and play you know, golf year round instead of sitting on the couch watching it snow in the winter. And uh, which is what I said to my dad one day when we were watching the clam bake and it was February and there's six feet of snow piled up outside the window with a fire in the fireplace and the clam bakes on and it's green grass, blue skies, beautiful ocean, you know, pros and ams having a great time wearing their colorful uh, cardigans. And I looked at dad and I looked out the window and I said, how does one get from here to there. And uh, he said, work hard, save your money and invest. And so, boy, at 12 years old, I took that advice uh, pretty headstrong. And so I went down to the University of Texas to try to walk on the freshman team and managed to do so. Uh, didn't get a lot of playing time because, you know, I was from out of state and there's a lot of Texas players on that team. And and my game was, was not the best. I wasn't, um, you know, I was a poor kid from Indiana. So I remember I had my motorcycle. I'd tie the shoes to the bag and throw the bag on my back and off to practice I'd go. And I remember the, the looks I got from some of these Texas guys going, 
where is this guy coming from? But, uh, you know, it, it kind of, and it also kind of burnt me out a little bit on the game. So uh, that's kind of when my, my, my best years are behind me now, but that's, those were my best years for sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, those are great memories. And, um, you know, I, the, the, there's a accompanying uh, excerpt on firepitcollective.com and uh, took some, have some photos of like the med, the little medallion you got from the USGA to, when you played in the US Junior in Hilton Head. I mean, that, that that's a great keepsake. I, at least you have those memories, Jack. I, I, I never did anything in junior golf, <laughs> so it's okay. You, you peaked early, but at least you had a peak. But Yeah, that's, <laughs> you know, it was fun. It, and it, it really shaped me as a person, too, because you learn a lot about go, uh, character when you play golf and you play it as a gentleman and you play by the rules. Um, and you get into difficult situations, you got to be patient and persevere and get out of them. So, uh, I really cherish the, the years I spent playing golf. I encourage any father to, you know, get their, their sons or daughters in the game. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and we should note that you're, you're taping this, uh, from your home over in Pebble beach. So apparently you followed your dad's advice and, and you, you've played in the first tee open and you've, you've kind of that, that dream you had when you were 12 sort of came true. So that, that's, that's a really cool part of this. Yeah, it really is. Thanks. Uh, so your sophomore year, you're walking into class with, with one of your buddies who happened to be from Houston and he runs into a, a, fr- a high school friend of his name, Lauren Catuzzi. And, um, she had moved around a little bit, lived in New Jersey at times. Her father was a football coach, but, um, when, what was your first impression when you, when you met Lauren there in the doorway of this classroom? Uh, immediately was struck by the beauty of her eyes, uh, was immediately struck by, um, her beauty overall, but her eyes were just arresting and then her sweet voice and, uh, and her, just her spunky attitude and just, you know, it, it just was amazing. There was just sparks going all over the place for me anyway. And later <laughs> I found out, uh, she felt the same way, but it took a while for us to eventually go on that first date. Right. So, um, I, this is this is all in the book, but it really makes me laugh. You know, your buddy is dating Lauren's roommate, so you you call up uh, Lauren's apartment, pretending to look for your friend, even though you know he's not there, just because you <laughs> want to flirt with her. And in in the context of, of this this conversation, what what does she say to you that kind of head sends you guys down this path? Oh, you know, she she wanted to go to this uh, concert, a, a band I'd never heard of before, and she told me it was you too. And so that that opened the door right there. I said, OK, here's my chance. Uh, I, I said, I can get his tickets. And I don't know if I said us, but I said I can get tickets, I guess. And uh, so I secured them through a friend of mine and uh, showed up at her doorstep. Um, and it is in the book that I have flowers and wine and the tickets and I'm tapping on the, the door frame because she's left the apartment door open. She's in the bathroom brushing her teeth. And she said, oh, thanks for the ticket. Uh, just leave it on the, the counter there and the money's on the desk. And I'm kind of befuddled. <laughs> uh, and she comes out of the bathroom and she says, oh, oh, it's a date. <laughs> and she goes, OK, great. And that's uh, that's where it took off. <laughs> she thought you were just a ticket broker. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I, I, you know, some would say I was kind of conniving in doing so, but hey, it won me the date. So, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, come on! And the history of romance is 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 full of grand gestures like that, Jack. Come on. Yeah. So, well, yeah, uh, for sure. <laughs> so th- this was this was 1983, and. Um, you know, the pe- people who know the U2 catalog will, will recognize the lyric. It's from One Tree Hill. And that was that was Lauren's favorite song. Right. And yeah. um, it, it, again, this excerpt that's on, on our website kind of lays some of this out. I don't want to spoil too much of the magic, but, um, you know, U2 plays a role in, in, in Jack and Lauren's courtship and and, and beyond. And um, I would strongly encourage you to read the excerpt because there's there's really some 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 beautiful uh, symmetry in, in, in the lyrics of the song and, and their own, their own journey together. But, um, so after grad, after graduation, you guys settle in, in San Francisco, you get married and for, you know, I feel like Lauren's, uh, someone I know really well from all our conversations, but, uh, for, for the listeners, just, just give them a little snapshot of what kind of person she was and, and her spunk and vitality and all of it. Well, she was a very petite young lady and, um, 
but pound for pound was as tough as any guy I ever met and probably mentally more so. Um, she was the best friend you could have. Uh, uh, she went out of her way to help people. She always continued to grow, um, you know, learning to skydive, scuba dive, learning, becoming an EMT, uh, all these things she felt gave women more courage and confidence to lead their lives instead of, you know, just kind of shrinking back and, and being, you know, a, a housewife. And um, she didn't, she, she, she wanted to help others who struggled with that as well and just say, hey, you can do it and I'll help you. And that was the name of her book uh, that she wrote posthumously through her sisters. And, um, but she was, you know, she was, uh, she'd been around a lot of testosterone in her life growing up with a football coach as a father. I mean, she played catch at an exhibition game with Terry Bradshaw and Lynn Swan, and I was forever jealous of that. <laughs> but, um, you know, she, she'd come out and, We'd be pitching horseshoes at Thanksgiving in the in the bayou back behind the Catuzzi's house and drinking beer with my brother-in-laws and smoking cigars. And she'd come out in a man's coat with a cigar in her mouth and a beer in her hand and go, hey, boys, let's go out and pitch some shoes, you know. So she had a great sense of humor, um, an excellent sense of humor. Um, you know, she she also had an excellent sense of humility. You know, she'd, she'd make fun of herself to make everybody feel better. And I think the lesson there is that everybody has insecurities and 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 anxieties. And when you meet someone like Lauren, who can make you feel so comfortable, um, you know, you drop your guard a little bit. And I think she had that magic about her. Yeah. There, there's a neat quote from her sister Vaughn in, in talking about how Lauren, you know, in high school was friends with everybody, every click she moved effortlessly through. And even though she was one of you know, the popular girls or whatever, she just, uh, she didn't even know it. She just kind of had that, that, that touch where she could connect with anyone. I, I thought that was the really said a lot. And, um, yeah, he just, just such a, such a standout person. Um, so, you know, one, one in, in researching this book, you know, the, the, the passengers of United 93, so many of them weren't supposed to be on that flight. And that, that's one of the interesting parts of, of that whole day. And so on, on September 6, 2001, you know, Lauren went, went back, back East to, uh, her gram her grandmother's funeral, um, but she, she had a secret she was going to share and, um, can, can you talk about just that, that moment in your lives and, you know, it'd been a journey to, to get pregnant. Um, and, and now she was ready to share the news. Like, uh, you know, it, it would have been what, 10 years you guys were trying to get pregnant. How challenging was that? And, and I guess how, how joyful was, was it to, to finally, uh, you know, get there? Yeah. You know, it's funny. You start out in marriage and you're trying not to get pregnant because you're not ready to have kids. So um, it's it's a funny dichotomy. And then when you are trying, your friends all say, great, great job if you can get it. You know, it's it's um, but it makes it stressful then, you know, all of a sudden it, it goes from enjoyment to to stress a little bit, uh, which I think holds you back. But yeah, we had, we had reached a level in our life where we had moved from our apartment in the city and bought a house in, in Marin. Uh, big enough to have a nursery and uh, or two if we needed it uh, to start the family. However, it's not that simple. Um, and, and as we found out, uh, Lauren had a few complications like uh, uh, a, a blocked fallopian tube that could and was repaired. But the other one was kind of in a, in a, a situation where it could cause an eptopic pregnancy, which would be dangerous to her life, could take her life. But um, so actually, we did manage to get pregnant uh, when she was 36, two years earlier, uh, but sadly miscarried uh, about uh, two months into it. So we were we were set back and struggling and, and feeling like, well, maybe we're just going to be happy with pets instead of kids. Um, and I think that kind of released, you know, the, the pressure a little bit that, you know, you put on yourself to have kids. And I've heard it time and time again. So. Fortunately, we got pregnant again, and uh, she was three months pregnant with our first child when she left, and she and I hadn't told anyone because we didn't want to kind of jinx it or we wanted to make sure it came through to full, you know, one one trimester, and then we would let everybody know, and that's exactly what her plan was, is to, after the funeral of her for her grandmother, is to reveal the great news that we're finally going to have a child because her older sister and her younger sister already had three kids, and we were kind of you know, hoping to join that fraternity. But um, uh, she went back and she stayed a little longer than she would have so that she could do the reveal. And uh, uh, 
uh, on that night, she said, I'm going to, you know, hunker down with a, a movie with my sisters and have my favorite popcorn mixed with vegetables and, uh, and, um, don't call me, I'll call you in the morning. Uh, and so, uh, I said, what are you watching? And they, uh, ironically, she told me that it was Castaway, um, which had a little bit of a parallel after I think about it, but, um, yeah, she got to the, to the airport, the car arrived early on September 11th, which was unusual. There was no traffic, which is unusual. Um, going from New Jersey to New York. And so she arrived really early, which she never did. Um, in fact, she normally kind of close and missed flights. But this day she arrived early. Uh, there was a, a very light load on United 93 that, that she could stretch out. And, and they asked her if she wanted to get home early. And so I, my first message from her was, hey, I'm going to get home early. I'm excited. And, you know, you know here's when I'll get, get home to pick me up. And, uh, it, yeah, I mean, as, as in the book, there's a lot of, uh, interesting and, um, uh, uh, just, you know, not beyond coincidental, uh, how some of the passengers of United night flight 93, um, were not supposed to be on there, but did. And, uh, to me, I think it's a little bit providential because of the amazing act and courage and bravery. And I know Lauren, um, had every bit of the courage and bravery that, that was needed. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to that. But so, you know, back in those days, there was these phones on the, that were hardwired into the back of the seats. You, you could swipe with a credit card. And I did that all the time. Those, those, those pre-cell phone and in the nineties when I was traveling for sports illustrate, I use those phones a lot. I have fond memories of them actually. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's 6 AM in California as the events begin unfolding on, on nine 11, you're asleep that, you're upstairs. The answering machine is downstairs. You would turn the ringer off because those were the days of telemarketers, you know, calling at all hours. And um, so Lauren's first phone call was to say she'd gotten on another flight. She didn't say what the flight number was. And so you, you wake up in California and you start your day and you're shaving and, you, you know, you turn the TV on and there's smoke pouring out of the Twin Towers. And like every American, I mean, I remember that vividly. We were all just so shocked and, and confused at what was happening. But um, you know, initially, uh, you know, as you write in the book, your thoughts were more about your brother, who was a, an airplane pilot who flew out of New York and Boston a lot. But at some point, uh, you realize that, you know, Lauren, there's some confusion about where she is. Her sister calls, asks if she's been in touch. So when, then you go down to the answering machine and, and she left a second message from the plane as, as the events were unfolding on United 93. And, um, you know, the, this, this message that Lauren left you, it's been used in documentaries. It's, um, it's quite a, a powerful, uh, sort of to me, document of, of, of love and of, even of hope in some ways. And, um, we're going to play that for the listeners, uh, right now. Uh, Jack is, has, a, you know, agrees it's, it's kind of something that people should hear. So, um, Jake, roll that tape. Honey, are you there? Jack, pick up, sweetie. Okay, well, I just wanted to tell you I love you. We're having a little problem on the plane. Um, I'm totally fine. Um, I just love you more than anything. Just know that. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable and I'm okay for now. Um, just a little problem, so... I'll, uh, I, I just love you. Please tell my family I love them, too. Bye, honey. You know, I've listened to that now a lot of times, Jack. What I'm struck by is Lauren's so her She's so calm. You know, where where did she get that, that strength in, in such a, a frightening moment? Oh, I, that little doubt. I, I really sensed her her parents, you know, the DNA was showing her dad, a football coach, you know, strong, sturdy guy, her mom, a very, um, selfless and loving person. And, you know, that's, that's kind of her DNA. And then, you know, her, her personality was such that she didn't want to worry me or leave a haunting promise that she would, might call me back. Um, you know, at the point where she called from the plane, you know, they were gathering information and, and they knew they were in peril. And they had 
pretty much figured out by that time that they were on a suicide mission and the only hope they had was to wrestle back control. Uh, and there was some hope, you know, there was a, a, a pilot on board, albeit not a commercial pilot, but someone who could have taken control and an air traffic controller uh, who could have maybe helped them land. And I think they felt that that hope, but they also knew they they had to stop these guys from, you know, further carnage on the ground, uh, given the information they had about the Pentagon and the two, the Twin Towers, um, which is amazing. And then to look out the window at 500 feet and realize they, they didn't want to, you know, start their assault until they were over a rural area so that if they didn't succeed, it wouldn't hurt anybody on the ground. Um, it's just fascinating to me. Lauren's, you know, voice, I think was calm because she wanted to be sturdy for the other passengers around her. She didn't, she wasn't panicked or anything like that. And she didn't want me to know that she was panicked and it doesn't sound like she was. So, um, but she was level-headed and, and just the ultimate gift in life is love. And to, to share that with one another is stronger than the, uh, you know, the motive of the hijackers, which is hate and hate's a very dangerous I idealism. So, you know, it's a, uh, I think it, it, it won out in this circumstance. She didn't live, but it won out. Yeah, that's really beautifully said. I mean, that, that, that message, it is, a, it's just a monument to love and unconditional love and, um, there's there's a line in in the book that's always stuck with me. You know, the passengers on United ninety three were really the, the first heroes in in the war on terror because we know that that plane was heading back to Washington D.C. either to take out the White House or the Capitol building. And beyond being these incredible symbols of our democracy, there was also a lot of people's lives who were at risk. They, they didn't even really know it. And um, and so yeah, it is it is an incredible thing that that all those passengers did and. Um, you know, what people may not remember is that the United 93 was was delayed about 45 minutes on on the runway. So that's how the passengers kind of knew what was happening. They were uh, as they were calling home and getting re reports uh, after the, after the plane was hijacked. You know, people started using those phones, and that's when their loved ones were telling them, "Well, this happened at the Twin Towers. This happened at the Pentagon." So it really um, it really was. Uh, a democratic action is, is you also, you write, you know, that they, they talked amongst themselves, what should we do? They came to a consensus and they acted. I mean, it was a very American moment where um, the, the passage on the plane, you know, collectively fate brought them together. Um, it's hard to say why all those people were on that plane, but they were, and, and, and they made, they made that decision and they probably saved many lives. So uh, I, I, heroes is a word that gets tossed around a lot, but I think in, in this case, it's very, it's very fitting. Well, it's also symbolic um, because when I looked at the manifest, you know, the passenger list was young, old, male, female, gay, straight, black, white, uh, Asian, um, you know, uh, mothers, fathers, uh, mothers to be. And, you know, it, it just it, it to me signified the melting pot of our society here in America. And what really makes me pride it, gives me the most pride is they all came together at a perilous moment and they voted, like you said, um, and they, uh, they took action. Um, and it, it just, it just shows the power of, of coming together to really defeat a bigger cause. Yeah. And, and one of the things that you'd said in our conversations that I think is, is an important point is the what happened at the Pentagon and the Twin Towers was so intensely visual, and you know, we'll all, none of us will ever forget the what we saw. But there's no images of United 93. I mean, it was never captured by anyone on the ground. Um, uh, you know, we don't nothing not, nothing survived from uh, if if anyone was recording anything on board. There were some phone calls um, that were recorded, and they became important documents in in piecing together uh, what happened. But um, and so, you know, you, you talked about how so uh, a, a school kid referred to United 93 as, as the forgotten plane. And that part of your, your motivation for writing this book was, was to remind people what happened and, and, and to bring bring their memories alive and, and especially Lauren's. But can, can you speak to that a little bit, Jack, about just uh, why you wanted people to remember? Yeah, I'm you know, I came across an interesting stat and that. Um, really kind of uh, shocked me recently is that um, half the population on the world was born after September 11th and uh, 2001. 
And if it, that is a true stat, it's a staggering stat, but it's also a stat that says half the people on the planet weren't here to experience it. And for those who have experienced it, and it's, it's kind of a, a very visceral uh, time in our lives. The uh, comment that the young man made, and, and now he works at the 9-11 Museum in New York, uh, ironically, and he wrote his own book. Uh, but the comment that he made, and I think he was at the tender age of about 10 years old, was, you know, I wanted to find out more about your loved one because I, one of my classmates said, oh, that's the plane that didn't do anything. And if they mean didn't hit its target, that's kind of sad recollection recollection of what it really did do. It did quite a bit. It's the plane that was loaded with with people just like you and me going about their daily lives and being thrust into warriorship. They had to they had to become you know battle hardened, make a plan, and attack. And they were the first victory, I say, against uh, terrorism in our in our defense of our country against terrorism. So in that respect, I, I felt I, I, I've always felt that um, I will speak on behalf of the of the passengers and crew that don't get to that, you know, people should remember uh, their courage. They should uh, take hope in that courage and maybe some inspiration from it, too. Yeah, that's really well said. Um and one thing that I think is neat about this book is it takes this this huge historical event and shrinks it down to the experience really of one person. You know, it's obviously you. And um, from visiting the the White House after nine eleven to to going to Shanksville in the days days after the crash, where and what it was like for all all of the family surviving family members. And I think it's so powerful because it, it you know it's it's now been twenty plus years and. Um, some of the, some of the details recede, but they, they really come back when, when you read, when you read this story, but more than anything, I think it's, it's, you know, it's your journey. It's very personal to you. And, um, can you speak to just, you know, the desire to help others because you were in about as deep a dark a hole as any, any person could be thrust into, uh, after losing Lauren and, and, and your child and, how how are you able to to bring yourself back from that that precipice and what what kind of wisdom did you kind of gain in, in, in this journey yeah it's well i knew that right away that i was going to be faced with uh, a lot of uncharted waters if you will um, like the river i didn't know what was around the bend next because i went from being an expected father to a widower um and i remember walking to that precipice and looking and it's a deep dark hole down there and I said, okay, what would Lauren want? And I drew inspiration from every bit of her being as a, as a, as a mortal. Uh, and I, I said, okay, she'd want me to turn around and <laughs> no pun intended, walk on another U2 song, right? Mm -hmm. Which helped me a lot actually in the after days because it, it was such a powerful song, walk on. We all get faced with trauma. We all get faced with difficulties. You just got to figure out how to walk on. So I did a lot of that um, moving forward in her spirit, in her memory. But what I wasn't ready for was the, I thought I could handle the, you know, the trauma, the shock, the grief, and you just can't do it on your own. I mean, I lost 30 pounds in the first three months and being from Indiana, I grew up, you know, with a stigma about mental health that, that I guess, you know, said, I'm not going to see a therapist. But yet when I went to the doctor, he said, you're not sick or anything. You're just depressed and you should see a counselor. And so I did. And it turned out to be one of the best things that I ever did. And it taught me a lot of lessons that I could use using going forward. Uh, but I also learned that it doesn't just, you know, cure itself. It doesn't, once you get through it, you, you've got to constantly monitor it. And in my case, there was a, an extra variable and it was the unborn child, which I, uh, still every year would think about, okay, would he or she be this age? What would they be doing? And, you know, I kind of let it haunt me to a point where it wasn't healthy. And it was Sarah that said, you know, maybe you should go back and see a therapist, which I did. And he said, I think you need to see a specialist. And I said, okay. And that, that specialist turned out to be a, another saving grace. And through a treatment called EMDR, she realized that I had never properly mourned or memorialized the unborn child. And she asked me, you know, what'd you do with Lauren's ashes? And I said, I still have them. For some reason, I can't get rid of them. I just hold it on for some reason. I don't know what to do. And she said, you know, the DNA of the baby is in those ashes. Maybe you should, you know, give them both a proper 
release. And, uh, and it just, boom, you know, it was like, oh gosh, you're right. And, uh, and so I was able to release the ashes and it helped me take another step. It's, it's like a book. Uh, it's, it's mm -hmm. chapters of closure and then you move forward. And much like this book is going to be a chapter closure, big one for me, uh, because it was that very therapist back in 2015 that told me I should write all this down in a diary. And then you came along and helped create that and patiently nurture it for six years um, to the point where Rare Bird has jumped on board and helped us publish what I'm getting wonderful, rewarding and gratifying feedback on. Yeah, that's really neat. And you mentioned Sarah, um, that, that, that's your wife now of, of a few years and she, she plays an important role in this book and of course in your life. And when, when people ask me what this book's about, I often say it's a love story and they're, they don't know how to take that because, you know, they think that this nine 11 book is going to be so heavy, but you know, it's a love story to Lauren, who's an incredible person and you really bring her to life in, in such a dynamic way. And, and I, I think any reader's going to, uh, have such great affection for her. And, um, and then Sarah comes into your life and, you know, I feel like you kind of saved each other. You know, you, you, you had your, your struggles. She was dealing with her own things like we all do as human beings. And, you know, I, there's a line that she says where it, it's in the book, you know, it's in her voice, but you know, that she was, she was looking for, I guess, a perfect relationship, but what she realized is, you, you know, you have to create that yourself. It, it doesn't, there's no fairy tale out there. Like it, it's, it's, you have to believe in each other and, and you have to fight for each other. And that, that really comes through in the pages. And so it's kind of a love story times too, because, you know, Sarah, Sarah's this, this, this great, um, lively English lass. And of course she's enriched your life so much and she's become a dear friend to me as well. And, um, so I, the book does have a happy ending, you know, I, uh, there's, there's a, well, I don't want to spoil too much from the book, but what, what did it mean to you, you know, after all these years to, to finally remarry that was a big chapter as well, right? Like there's, there's a, there's the scene from the, the wedding where you go a little crazy on the dance floor. Can, can you, can you explain that and what you're feeling in that moment? Yeah, no, that was, uh, again, pure joy, um, and bliss and, um, once Sarah, you know, without giving away too much of, of the story, but once she recovered from her um, throat cancer surgery, uh, you know, it made me realize I, I wanted to be with her for the rest of my life. And I was glad that she was given a second chance and, um, and I wanted to make it as rich and as full as possible. So I asked her to marry me, which I think completely shocked her because she didn't think I'd ever remarry. But the truth of the matter is, I've said this, it, 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 if Lauren and Sarah had met, they would have been best friends and because they're so much alike. And in that, I, I realized that, well, maybe Lauren's up there in the, in the stardust sprinkling a little bit on my head saying, hey, silly, this is, this is what I brought you, a special angel. Now, don't ignore it. And um, I'm a little slow, a little dense, and my friends know I can be a bit stubborn. But uh, in this case, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to argue with the angel I have up there. And, and I certainly want to continue to love the angel I have down here. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel pretty lucky. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's brought happiness into my life. I remember after September 11th, I was always a morning person. And after September 11th mornings, I dreaded. I was just a depressed, mean, sad person. And, uh, and probably usually hung over. Um, but I, I now enjoy my mornings and wake up happy and bring Sarah her tea. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great place to be again. And I, I, you know, I really, really uh, owe it all to her. No, that's really sweet. I mean, I think probably listeners have a, a feeling for it, but you know, the, the zest you have for life and just the, the optimism, um, you know, for me personally, it's, it's very inspiring. Like, you know, you've, you've been through a heck of a lot, but you, you seem to, um, you know, retain that, that, that fundamental belief and, um, that, that there's good things out there. And, um, that's all, it's always meant a lot to me. It's, it's, you know, it comes through on the golf course for sure. When we play, um, I've gotten more pep talks from Jack than anyone, any other human on the planet, you know, after I'm taking double bogey to lose a hole and I'm sulking, but like, um, you know, how, how have you managed to, to keep that, 
that um, that spirit about you, Jack, through all that you've been through? Well, I cover that a little bit in the book, but I, I just say it's from the people like you and the other friends I have around me. Um, you know, it, it, it does take support. Um, and and when you find, you know, they, that you get that love from others, you know, it motivates you. And uh, and I like to have fun. I mean, I, you know, I'm not serious on the golf course, as you know. I like to, to joke around and rib each other. And, um, and, and I also still like to, you know, try to carve a shot like I used to. But um, – it, it, it's perspective mostly and contentment that has um, revealed itself in my life and my, my new, new life with Sarah and, and that, you know, you can't look back. You can only move forward like a river. You know, you, you're just going to swim it against the tide if you do. And we know that's a losing battle. So I'm, I'm just, you know, enjoying, you know, the journey and hoping that there's, you know, a, a smoother waters the rest of the way. Um, and, and then really is, is kind of my motivation, Alan. And again, thanks for, for being a friend and pushing me to do this. Um, it was scary. It was not something I thought I should do or would do, but, um, as I said, you, you were patient and you helped nurture it. And when I was in the ICU, um, in 2020 for my burns, I realized there's a lot of people that might benefit, um, who were losing loved ones, um, shockingly and sadly and quickly without saying goodbye to COVID. And so if this book touches one or two people that um, will go seek mental um, counseling, maybe EMDR because it's, it's real trauma. Um, and, uh, and also I'd like to, as I say in the book, destigmatize mental health um, awareness. I, I wish they would change PTSD to PTSI because it's not a disorder. It's an injury to your brain. And, you know, if you break your arm, you go to the doctor, he sets it, he puts it in a cast and, the, you know, that's how you fix your broken arm. Well, when you when you get a broken mental health situation, you you really need to go seek that health as well. And it it worked. I Again, I was a, one of those people that was very pessimistic and didn't believe in hocus pocus treatments and whatnot. But uh, uh, I opened my eyes and, and gave it a try and it, it, it helped immensely. Yeah, I think I think when people read this, that they uh, it, it will it will it will open their eyes on a lot of a lot of different things, and um, it really it was it was a great pleasure and honor to, to help to help write this book. Um, it's called "Like a River to the Sea: Heartbreak and Hope in the Wake of United '93." Um, this is Jack Grant Collis. I'm Alan Shipnuck. You have any any final thoughts before we let our listeners go, Jack? Um, I will just tell your listeners that Alan Shipnuck is a very honorable man. He's a lot of fun to play golf with, even though he doesn't have a hole in one. Um, <laughs> he, he does anguish over that. And I, and again, that's why I kidding, but he's a fine journalist, uh, a wonderful friend and, and was recently honored uh, by the Salinas, um, sports writers hall of fame, right? Um, well, it was actually just the sports hall of fame. Anyone sports could get hall. into it. Um, Apparently, because I, I came in through the side door, but no, a lot of great athletes. Uh, that was the subject of my 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 speech. Like, does a sports writer really belong in an athletic hall of fame? And uh, uh, I don't know the answer to that. But, you know, a, I will say that telling stories is is very gratifying. And this is this is one heck of a story uh, yours. So uh, it, it's it's been a journey, but we made it. So, yeah. Um, if, uh, if anyone wants to check out the excerpt, it's at firepitcollective.com. Um, book is available anywhere you buy books, uh, of course, Amazon and places like that. If you go to the, the publisher's website and you, you want to support the publisher directly, um, it's rarebirdlit.com, and um, you, can, you, can, you can get it there. But um, I think that's all we got for now. Thank you for listening. Uh, Jack, I'll see you on the first tee. <laughs> and um, that's it for this very special podcast. Goodbye.